let's start. Okay, it's we're officially recording. There we go, and I see that. Okay, yeah. so what we're doing here, and I'm going to keep myself a little to the side here only because uh, of the blur in the middle of my uh, camera. Uh, okay. What we're doing here is our second uh, GCL interview. Uh, the first one we did with... Um, Coyote the Blind, uh, Ricardo Flores, uh, a strong member of our church. And uh, now today we are doing our second interview with Ryan Higgins or Shalev. Uh, Ryan Higgins is on the board of directors of the Gnostic Church of Light uh, and uh, uh, a high-end AA uh, member in our lineage that oversees the Gnostic Church of Light. So... Um, Ryan, uh, to begin, I think uh, we, we uh, you know, that's that's all too brief an introduction. Uh, I, I think we need to understand who uh, who and what you are a little bit and you know, get some semblance of uh, history, your development, uh, pre-AA experience coming to uh, both the AA and the church. All right. Sure. Um, wow. Yeah, that's a while ago. Um, I, that's really a long time ago. Yeah, so it really goes all the way back to when I was in high school, you know, when I was maybe 17 or 18. And uh, um, I had a buddy who was studying the occult. And he wasn't very serious, of course, but um, something. And he was talking about things like uh, the Necronomicon and the Book of the Law. And uh, I actually first heard of the Book of the Law when I was reading the Necronomicon, the uh, Simon version. And when and and it, it's funny because it was very neutral what he wrote, but he had also repeated a lot of uh, the negative press about Crowley. And um, and then he said, you know, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. And uh, I just I just couldn't stop thinking about it, you know. And okay. and then I eventually look for the book of the law and, and I wanted to learn magic and I just started looking everywhere I could find out about magic and, and, and then to Lima. Uh, and to make it even more interesting, uh, I was going to a Catholic school and I was not very religious at that point, though I was on and off. I was definitely spiritual. I was definitely into praying. But um, I remember... Um, I had a buddy of mine whose parents were in like a cult. They were in like um, uh, some born again Christian cult. And uh, they used to have these camping trips. And he invited me to go because their parents were really stupid. So we'd just go there and smoke lots of weed and get really drunk. You know, that's what teenagers do, right? And, um, and I remember uh, the people there wanting to pray for me. And they were talking about demons and, and magicians. And I said to him, what, you mean magic's real? Like, yeah, people can really, you know, call spirits and use them to get things they want. And it's bad. You're going to go to hell if you do it. And that's like, huh, that sounds cool. <laughs> and that just made me want to learn more about magic, you know. <laughs> of course, uh, not the superstitious way of it, but it made me want to search for something. Even though I thought these people were a bit nuts, I knew there are lots of books about the topic. And you know, there are intelligent people throughout history that had been into the occult. And I'm like, well, I, I like getting things that I want. You know, I, I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> so that was that okay, was so, my way of thinking, you know. So you but your experience uh, or at least uh, your interests are much wider than just uh, calling spirits, getting into the occult. There's a lot more. Going oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I just thought I'd go right from the beginning. How did I, I get into it, right? Um, but that's that's really how I started out. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking as a teenager, right? You know, 17, 18, you know, just a dipshit at that age, right? You know, what, what do I know then? But there was this impulse toward magic. And it even go, went all the way back, I think, to when I was a kid. As I noticed whenever, whenever I was a kid, um, I really felt I had a sort of natural openness with my unconscious i could remember things back to when i was two years old and i remember like just there'd be things that i'd be obsessed with almost anything i'd get obsessed with would just start appearing in my life so like example i used to be really obsessed with 
collecting animal skulls and skeletons. And next thing you know, within like a few months, my dad's friends are bringing in deer skulls and I'm finding moose skulls in the woods. And, you know, and um, I, I, I had this sense of a, a natural kind of magic, which was really just sort of programming my unconscious to just really focus, right? And then you send off, you know, you just send off all these subtle signals to your friends and your parents, and you're not even aware of it. And, and you, you start, you know, things start falling into play. And then the, the same thing happened with my music in high school. So let's fast forward a bit, because I think what you're getting at were my other interests. So, um, you know, I, I, I went through uh, as a professional musician, and I ended up moving to Montreal to pursue that. Uh, and I, you know, I, I played in several bands and did concerts and made CDs, but nothing was terribly successful. Uh, but it was successful enough, you know, I was able to live off of my music almost uh, on and off for a while. The problem was is I had kids and then, you know, family started to become more interesting to me. And so I had to go back to university, you know, because I dropped out of university in my my second year to pursue a music career. And then three years later, I'm like, okay, I got to go back because, um, you know, I, I can't stand working in warehouses and, and call centers anymore. And uh, it's like, okay, I got to do something I love and, and that I really, because, you know, um, I, I can't do anything unless I'm really 100% invested. And the only thing I was invested in was learning about history, philosophy, and religion. Because that's what I was doing anyways. When I wasn't in my band and when I wasn't working at some shit job, I was reading piles of books. You know, I, I would go through two or three books a week. <clears throat> you know, on my breaks at work, I'd be reading books on philosophy or on the occult or on history or on religion. And I'd like hide in the stairwells and read them so that I wouldn't be, you know, stuck having to talk about shit that I'm not interested in with my, my coworkers. So don't get me wrong, I had some really cool co-workers, yeah? And I had some really hot co-workers, too. And, um, you know, that led to some other stories, which I'll save for another day. <laughs> but anyways, um, so I said, okay, if I'm going to study again, and I need to study again, because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do this kind of work anymore. And, uh, you know, I want to supplement my career as a musician. So I decided to study of religion which is a division in the arts and sciences in, in, in the universities in Canada, where you're, you're using sociology, history, uh, philosophy, and psychology, different disciplines to look at um, religions. And um, I was really interested in uh, Eastern religions, uh, mainly because I'm a philosopher first, and I was really disappointed in my philosophy classes um, that they didn't talk about any Indian philosophy or any Japanese philosophy, etc. And I really wanted to delve into that side of it. And a lot of that was really enmeshed with Asian traditions, such as Buddhism and, uh, you have, you know, the, the eight schools of philosophy in Hinduism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I was having such a blast finishing my, my, my BA. I just didn't want to go back to work. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'll do my MA and if I'm lucky, I'll find a job and maybe I'll make more money, you know, and, you know, and, and I might enjoy my studies. And I did for the most part. You know, my first two years of my MA were great. And then I just hated it, uh, not because of uh, the, the discipline I was in. I hated it because I couldn't really study the discipline I was in. It, it became more of a, a propaganda program of postmodernism, you know, and, and nothing was overt, but there was a, a sort of a sort of a, a non-spoken suppression of ideas. I was really into Jung and well, of course, I'm an occultist, of course, I'm into Jung. And anytime I'd want to bring up Jung or anything like that, the professor would just ignore me, change the topic. And when confronting the professor afterwards about it, he said, well, Jung doesn't really tell us what the people actually thought that he was studying. He was just telling us about Jung. It was just this anti-essentialist postmodern uh, agenda just being rammed down our throats. 
And um, I mean, it was interesting to, uh, you know, I did enjoy some of my postmodern readings as part of a method, but it became really a socialist postmodern paradigm uh, agenda, which I don't have a problem studying it. I just didn't like the fact that uh, I, I just didn't feel like I was really studying my field anymore, or at least not as much as I wanted. And um, yeah, and then, and that's what made me not do my PhD. I wanted to write my own books and do my own research about something I really believed in. Because at this point, I felt that I was having to play a game, not with all of my professors, but with most of them, where you tell them what they want to hear so that you can get that grade. Because to stay in the, the MA program, you have to keep a high average, right? You know, your average goes too low, you get kicked out. But your average will, you know, can go low pretty easily if you write what you really think in your papers. So. Uh, I well, started you, to feel you, like you I was expressed this problem to me a whole bunch of times uh, you know, in postgraduate education that there really is um, uh, a I don't want to say a social stream, but there really is a certain uh, zeitgeist that has to be followed uh, a um, a a culture that is a closed culture that you either have to be accepted into by mimicking their ideas or you will be put out of. The, the, uh, the intellect and independent intellectual thought is not necessarily welcome. No, I'll give you a, a, a real stark example. Um, in my, my undergraduate years, I remember I, I had this professor, Dr. Ornstein, and um, we were studying, I think, about Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, and it was in ethics. And I wrote a paper that was in favor for a lot of Hobbes' views. Uh, and, you know, as far as I'm aware, I made consistent arguments. You know, I gave at least four or five arguments for my point and explored two counter arguments uh, for Hobbes' egoism. And he, he gave me a C on my paper, and he wrote that it wasn't original. Well, it went against everything that he was for in the class. Doesn't get any more original than that, <laughs> you know? And then and I asked him if he could give me an example of something original. So he handed me a paper that one of his female students did with an A plus on it. And the whole paper was a quotation of my professor. Everything my professor said in class was being quoted in the paper, you know? So yeah, he's the real <laughs> ego test. Yeah, so original, according to Dr. Orenstein, means quoting Dr. Orenstein and paraphrasing him, you know, and maybe referring to one or two other sources and basically, you know, being his yes man. That's what creativity means for him. Uh, but anyways, that's a stark example. Not all my professors were like that. I had some really awesome professors that really let me run around and pursue whatever I wanted. But there... It, it was in the graduate uh, program where I really felt it. And I was like, okay, I had enough. I, I want to I know what I think. I want to know what I think after sitting on something for a while and, and really write about it. And if I do do a PhD, I want to know what I really think first. You know? Um, now, now, I you, never, you, yeah. didn't, you didn't live totally in, in your head. Um, you also really brought a lot of physicality to uh, your occult practice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll get, yeah, I know what you're getting at, right? Uh, you're you're well, talking I, about I'm the that you arts. two lines with this. Okay, go ahead. Okay, because on the one hand, I know of your interest in, shall we say, Hollywood-style magic, and how that... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm less interested in it now, uh, and, and then it shifted into mentalism. Um... For a few reasons. One, and I, I wanted to know, you know, what can you really expect in the world of the occult, right? Because you hear all these stories of powers and things like that and, um, you know, the cities and, and it, you know, what can you really do and what is just, you know, good special effects? And I, I think we're beyond that today. I think it's pretty much common knowledge now. But, you know, in the 80s, you know, you had occultists that were trying to bend spoons with their mind, you know. <laughs> They, they didn't realize that Uri Geller had, you know, um, taken spoons that look identical to the spoons that he used and, you know, bent them a thousand times so that they're ready to break just with the touch, you know. 
before going on camera. You know? Yeah, well, he, he was a trickster for, uh, for sure. And yeah. indeed, I think one of the things that I learned from you was that you could take that trickster, that physical gag, because yeah. I mean, Hollywood style magic is a, is a physical discipline. It's really yeah, difficult it's physical... stuff in some of these tricks that requires tremendous muscular control. Um, but but there's, also, um, that... hmm? there's also a strong psychological element of it. Like, oh, well, uh, yeah. I'll... I can't demonstrate anything now um, because I'm holding a phone and, and I haven't prepared anything. But like, um, there's a coin vanish that I learned from Darren Brown. I took one of his private courses and to teach the essence of his mental magic. And there's basically you you take a coin and you go to make it disappear, right? But you make it fail on purpose. So you take a coin, you put it in your hand, you blow in your hand, and you open it, and it's still there, and you look like an idiot. But that's planned. That's on purpose. That's phase one. The second phase is, is you take the coin again, you put it in your hand, you blow on it, you open it, it's gone. You open the other hand, it's gone. And everybody's amazed because you don't have any gimmicks, you're not wearing any long sleeves. What they don't realize is the coin was never in your hand to begin with. <laughs> they right. imagine you putting it right. in your hand. They're, they're, your hands, were, your hands yeah. were empty. That's the mental side of it. And what you've done is you've programmed them to see a coin in your hand that was never there. And you acted like you're putting it in your hand. And you did that with the first supposedly, um, you know, trick that went wrong. They just remember that coin and they project it and they actually perceive it there. And I'm still blows my mind to this day. I fool teachers with it in the staff room once in a while when I feel like just fucking around, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but... Uh, you know, so there's a whole other side of it where you're working a lot with the unconscious and perception. And then, of course, there's a, a physical side of it as well. But then there's also, you know, we do know in real magic and when we're working with our unconscious um, that, you know, what you put into the astral plane consistently eventually manifests. Now, um, many occultists that confuse the planes and they think, that they can just manifest whatever they want. They think it doesn't need to make sense. And of course their lives are shit, you know, because they're living in a fantasy land, you know? Um, but you know, uh, it's a basic psychological fact that whatever you repeat yourself over and over and over again, uh, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, the problem is, is most people can't believe and, and imagine what they want to imagine. But if you use a magic trick, and the person is shocked and they believe in it, you can then, you know, get them to believe in something and, and they, they create like a self-fulfilling prophecy for themselves and their lives change, right? And that's where you hear about the shaman, you know, in uh, indigenous traditions where a guy has a fever and he sucks the fire out of the guy, but secretly has a hot coal hidden in his hand, right? And then he, he produces the hot coal and, the guy believes it and he feels better and it's psychosomatic. And people laugh at that shit today, but you know what? I love psychosomatics. I love placebos, man. I make my own placebos all the time. That's what real magic is, is making your own placebos. And when you're good at it, they work and they save you a lot of fucking money. And, you know, and you know what? They're really good because sometimes there are assholes you run into in your life and, and you need to get rid of them. So you can make placebos to get rid of them, you know, like, I'm, a, you know, a, a favorite trick I used to do uh, when I used to play against uh, my sister, we would play a game like horseshoes or something stupid like that. And, um, and you know, uh, I might have been tired or not feeling like playing. So what I do is I would tell her a story about a time when I was unfocused. And no matter what I did, I just kept fucking up. And it was so frustrating. And what it did is it would cause her to remember a time when she was fucking up. And then what that does is that, you know, when you remember something, it changes your brain chemistry, it changes your brain waves, and it affects your physical performance. And the next thing you know, she started fucking up all of her throats. She had no idea what I was doing to her, you know. But I, and then I told her what I was doing, and we laughed about it together, you know. She's a bit pissed off afterwards and I, I, I couldn't trick her as easily the next time. But that's an example on how um, we can use, um, you know, the mind to change our performance and our output. 
And there's, um, you a natural, know. there's a wonderful natural segue there that can take us right to your buddy Ark and oh, the work that you yeah. did with him. Or, yeah, or you uh, know, alongside him. As, as well, yeah, Ark introduced me to it, but um, uh, yeah, Ark, he was a, a good buddy of mine. Well, he still is a very good buddy of mine. I just haven't talked to him in a while because he lives in Montreal and he doesn't answer his phone much, but. Uh, he's a guy from the ex-Soviet Union, from uh, Minsk. <clears throat> very secretive. Sorry, Ark, for talking about you here. You might be mad at me for talking about him. He's very, very secretive, very distrustful. So I won't say too much about his personal life, just that uh, he's probably one of the craziest and funniest guys I know next to PJ. <laughs> and um, he introduced me to um, a Russian martial art called Sistema, but he also introduced me to just sort of um, many other sort of martial arts and ideas because he was a real martial arts enthusiast. I mean, he was crazy. I might be at his house eating with him and he'd just rip off his belt and start swinging at me to demonstrate, you know, a principle or a concept and like accidentally hit me in the head with it. You know, he was nuts. But on the other hand, he really taught me how to think quickly and to be on my toes because he was double my weight at that time. <laughs> Wrestling with him was not fun. <laughs> you know this you know but anyways um he got me really interested into in sistema there is a systemic uh and jujitsu club in montreal on drummond and uh in sistema there's um uh, there's a side of it that's really scientific that works a lot with biomechanics and applying principles and uh, physics to your body movement and then there's a strong psychological dimension to it. And that probably inspired me to actually study mentalism and magic as well, because um, you'll see a lot of videos of what they call no contact combat. Now, quick disclaimer, a lot of that's bullshit, um, but there is uh, an element of truth to it too. Um, in certain situations, you can, you know, influence people with, minimum physical contact and sometimes with none but it really depends on the situation and sometimes you do need physical contact you know uh but a lot of it's just using psychology and manipulating the fight or flight response that, that we have naturally um like when a person is in full adrenaline and they're going toward you and you give them the feeling like you're there and then suddenly you just disappear and they can fall or lose their balance you know and if it's done right, it looks magical, but it's just a bit of physics and psychology. Um, and then there are other ones where you do give people suggestions and, you know, to, you know, hurt their performance and things like that. And there's an energetic side as well, where you're slicing the aura or, um, you know, basically just projecting a negative intent at people. But, but, you know, it's not a magic bullet. But when you apply the body mechanics with, the use of energy and the use of psychology, it can be very effective. And for me, it was an important part of my, my initiation when I was in my neophyte in my zealator days. Um, as I felt when I was in my neophyte days, I was really exploring the shadow. And in Sistema, well, the teacher of my teacher was, you know, former KGB, <laughs> you know, and uh, there are people that kind of, you know, lived outside of the normal, you know, morality. Uh, if if I, I don't even think that word applies to them. Sorry. <laughs> you know, so it, it was really integral in exploring my shadow and developing, you know, understanding of the elements, which I think is part of the neophyte. And this might be a good example on how personal the grade work can be. So like for me, my neophyte work of working with the elements manifested through the martial arts and it manifested through uh, also um, camping. And I, I, I'm also really into the outdoors as well. And through my study of these various disciplines of psychological and uh, physical disciplines. Yeah. But for somebody else, it could manifest in a completely different way. Right. Like PJ, you know, you, you could you could testify to that, you know, on, on your own experiences, right? Going through neophyte and, and zillator. Yeah, I, I think one of the great things about uh, saying so this is a wonderful segue because I really want to get you to start to focus a little bit on your AA work more directly now. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things about 
any real AA work is that it is incredibly personal and we do not down any lineage or across lineages we do not in any way um, identify with somebody else's work we don't have uh, we do not have identical experiences <laughs> in the slightest we each come from a personal perspective and work through that uh, you know, right. as Crowley said, you know, there is no definition for the attainment of the Holy Guardian Angel. It's different for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, Crowley was naturally inclined toward, you know, writing. And so a lot of his brilliance manifested through writing in the command of the English language. And, and of course, through being a, uh, you know, a bit of a Don Juan, you know, hence his affinity with sex magic. Uh Another disclaimer I'd like to give away uh, to all of you aspiring AA students and thalamites out there, um, something I'd like to present to if I have any students watching this, um, we don't need to take on the master's sickness to, you know, to, um, to get what the master had. You know, Crowley had some issues and we, we all really need to be honest and accept that. And the AA is not really about Crowley. Um, Crowley is about the AA, you know, it's the other way around. And the AA is about finding your own, your own genius, uh, to use Crowley's own words, you know, and the Holy Guardian Angel is sort of um, a, an objectification of that genius, uh, at least in my, in my humble opinion. Uh, or, or as I would say, a, a manifestation of your own archetype, the archetype of who and what you are, you know, at that point in time manifesting to you externally and guiding you and um you know so like i, I see a lot of thalamites that have problems with drugs or they're addicted to sex so they're attracted to it because they see it as sort of a permission you know and like well, like don't get me wrong we all have our weaknesses but like those are weaknesses you know being addicted to drugs that's that's not your will you know your, your will is is whatever it is that will motivate you to really wake up, you know, and gets you going. And it's, it, you can't not do it, but you can suppress it. And you can, you know, you can, you can interfere with it. And that's probably why Nietzsche, Nietzsche was uh, against drinking. And his, his rationale was, well, it just numbs you to the pain of your failure and then makes you forget what your aspirations actually are. At least those were his observations of the average European man, right? Let's fuck the wife on Sunday and we'll get drunk with the boys and there's no development going on. Nobody's really, you know, tuning into and pushing themselves. And maybe I'm just being a pretentious asshole, but when I really explore myself, if I'm not honestly pushing myself to what I truly want, when I, I don't mean just what I want whimsically, right? But one thing that really motivates me, if I'm not really pushing myself to that, my life is meaningless, you know. My eyes will just shoot myself. You know, otherwise, what am I, you know, what are we doing here? So that's where the AA gets personalized, right? Because, yeah, there are exercises we should do. And there are objective benchmarks. Like, don't get us wrong. Uh, PJ, I, I hope I'm not speaking for you, but uh, there are objective benchmarks that you need to reach in the AA grades, right? Like, I can't claim to be a practicus if I can't sit still in a sauna, you know, yeah. you know, but well, yeah. are the, the AA represents a, a very definitive program that, um, you know, has its, uh, uh it, it has its own, uh, uh, tasks and code for behavior. Exactly. Uh, exactly. A bit more extreme perhaps than say a member of our church who right. will not, uh, you know, is not expected to have that same kind of discipline. In our church, we want we want to facilitate the genius of every individual in our congregation, but we're not assigning tasks. We're more or less encouraging. In, yeah, you know, in a communitarian manner. Well, I would also add the AA is it's not for everybody. But it, it's not the only way to attain, you know. Yeah. And like I, I wrote a blog article several months ago, and, and it got really good, really good feedback. But I, I really meant it. And I, I said, like, you know, um, 
you know, you might work really hard and become an adept in the AA, but you might find a guy on the street, you know, who might even be a Christian, at least externally, but who's more of an adept than you, you know, meaning like he's living a deliberate life. He knows what he want and he does it and he makes it happen, you know, and he's shining, you know. I think that's, that's a really that's nice what... way to say that. Uh, he's yeah. living a deliberate life. If we really wanted to talk about our average church congregant, we really want to say what we're encouraging you to do is to liber live deliberately. And that right. also means live deliberatively as well. You know, deliberate on your life, ruminate, think about where, where you've come from, where you are and where you're going and try to do that as consciously as possible. Which leads to my own shameless plug for de-liberation.com. Uh, uh, it's my little philosophy blog. I've only got maybe five posts on it, but I'm slowly building it up. But the name of that is exactly what you just said, PJ. But I, I, I put the hyphen between the DE and the liberation uh -huh. so that you get liberated by deliberating. And when you deliberate, you're thinking, you're reflecting, and you're digging. Because intelligence comes with activity. Your mind has to be active. It has to be moving and constantly moving. And, and on the other hand, when you deliberate, you understand who you are eventually. And then you can be deliberate. So it's a play on words. But there's also a French and German play on the words. Because the German is da for the, right? And French is uh so, you, and also in French, so you have deliberation, which means the freedom, the liberty, right? So, so just the, the name in that domain is meant to express, I guess, my own, let's say, um, uh, non-secular expression of Thelema, and which for me is deliberation. To me, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under the will is deliberation. It means you will get moksha, you will get freedom by reflecting intensively and honestly uh, and mercilessly with yourself and then putting that into action and, and dealing with the failure and then deliberating more until you get more and more on point with, with your essence, for lack of a, a better word, or the archetype which you encounter is, is sort of the core of your being. Uh, those are kind of nebulous terms but, but I would say what you experience to be as meaningful and, um, and soul moving in your own life. And that's a very personal thing. Now, the AA is one way to do that, and it's very intense. Uh, but I think there are dozens of ways of doing it. And if the dictums of an alchemy have any weight, um, you know, nature is constantly evolving, which means all of us are constantly being initiated. But we're not all doing it consciously. That's the thing. So the A is one way to go about it consciously. But, you know, you might be into following Ospensky or um, uh, who, what was the guy's name? I My mind's blank. The guy who Ospensky was really into. Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff. Yeah, Gurdjieff. You know, I don't really agree with Gurdjieff. I think he has interesting ideas. But, you know, you have all these different ways out there and they might resonate with somebody. But the Gnostic Church... I see it as a community for people that want to live deliberate lives and they don't necessarily identify as Christians or they, they feel that they're, you know, that they need something more or, you know, like for me, uh, no offense to anybody who does identify with Christianity out there. But for me, even as a kid, something about Christianity just didn't sit right with me. Um, it, it, at least how it was taught to me. How it was taught to me is I got to be basically emasculate and wear white clothes and I don't know, just look harmless, this harmlessness. And the way the old people would sing in my church, it was this sort of borderline dying kind of vibe, right? And to me, it's like, you know, even though I'm being taught that that's good and what I'm supposed to do, uh, the core of my being, basically my gut was just repulsed by it. It was not something I would want to show to my friends. You know, I wasn't rushing to be an altar boy, you know. But, um, but for me, Thelema, it's about rigor and it's about strength and force and fire. And the more I've studied the older Christianity, the older religions, to me, that's the true Christianity in a way. You know, Thelema, in a way, is trying to go back to what 
the Superman, uh, uh, the, this Christ consciousness, which, which to me is just, again, a self-aware, deliberate consciousness. You know? And, and that, that is where we will find our moksha. But we won't find it in some historical figure nailed to a piece of wood. In my humble opinion, uh, again, if there's anybody out there that, that really needs that, well, uh, I, that, that's just your way, you know. But um, that's just how I see it. That's how I honestly see it. But I, I am seeing Thelema is sort of, uh, in some way, is going to the, 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 the true Christianity in some ways, which is just, it's as if Christianity was never understood. Or, you know, if the, even if there was a, a guy called Jesus, he never taught people, um, you know, to deny life. and They should be sickly, right? Even the guy you read about, he was kicking over tables. He was doing what he wanted, you know. He was living a life that was meaningful to him. And and people just sort of created this life-denying religion out of it. All, all I know is if I was a tyrant that wanted slaves, I would definitely be wanting them to believe in that, you know. And I, I don't want to be a slave. I don't like being a slave. So that's just not what I believe in. It doesn't I think indirectly all. what you're saying is the Gnostic Church of Light represents something more life-affirming. Yeah, and yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for uh, condensing that into uh, something more concise. Example, it's the life affirming uh, nature, the, the pursuit of life, light, life and liberty. Right. The, from the light, life, love, and liberty. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Light, life, love and liberty. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I uh, and the more I reflect on it to me, that's why I, I've been attracted to, to Thelema. And, you know, Thelema is. You know, it, it's a very loose system. I, it's hardly a system aside from the AA. You know, you have Crowley's holy books. But basically, Crowley himself said, uh, find your unconscious will, unite it with your conscious will. You know, that's really it, you know, when you read his older commentaries to the, the book of the law. You know. Sounds then, like uh, the perfect space to actually uh, end the interview. And okay. So this this would be you know I think we've summarized everything really really well here. Um, Wait, did you want to mention maybe uh, the the two books I was working on? Maybe. Um, yeah, if you want, let's put them in there. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Just uh, I I am working on. Well, I have one book that I finished last year, which was basically just recordings of my own initiation work as a neophyte. That was called uh, Shades of Light and Darkness, where we go over all of the paths. Which is available now on Amazon. 231. Yeah. Now, um, if you are in the AA, I recommend that you don't read it until after you've done your work yourself. Um, so that way, when you have your own experiences, you won't be skeptical of them or think, oh, well, maybe... Maybe it's just what I read coming out, you know. It'll be more interesting for you to do some of your own experiences and then read and compare with the ones I've written down. Plus, uh, PJ... And so many you, others. Yeah. PJ we has his own archive. around that have done that. And we have some... Other yeah. But, you know. but so what you I... Have, you have deliberation.com. We have uh, 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 Light and Dark. Just give us the full title of that book again. Shades of Light and Darkness. Shades of Light and Darkness. Uh, it's not just my magical record, though. Like, it took me forever to put it together because I organized it. I organized it because you have the, um, basically, you, the, you have the paths on the Dome of the Serpent, right? And then you have the cars of the Khalifa. So I organized it because you're instructed in Library 231 to compare the sigils from the Dome of the Serpent with those of the Khalifa. But the ones that you're supposed to compare um, aren't parallel. Uh, a quick example. So the path of Aleph uh, and, and the fool, you're not supposed to necessarily compare the Dome of the Serpent from Aleph with also the Karsh of the Cleophob from Aleph. It's actually a, a different one. Actually, I think it's from the uh, Zadok that you're supposed to compare it with. Yeah. So yeah, I have an article parallel. myself out on some of that. Um, so what I did is I organized my book where my the record of my astral journey, say in Aleph, right? In the car in the dome of the serpent i and then i have a full kabbalistic commentary on the whole thing and then immediately after that i have the cars of the cleefoth for zadok so it follows that order 
So the comparison is given in each path. And it's not just comparing the sigil, we compare the visions. And the cool thing is, when I did these visions, I didn't read the instructions in Library 231. I just did them, right? And what's cool is there's some imagery that is the same and consistent that will match from some of the ones from the Dome of the Serpent, the Carcer of the Cleefall. And further, there are, I think it's five, I forget. I haven't looked at my work in a long time because I've been doing other projects for two years now. But there are, I think it's five, correct me if I'm wrong, other paths on the Karst or the Khalifov that are not listed to be compared to anything. And I, I thought, well, what am I supposed to do with these in a book, right? And so I delayed publishing the book because I didn't know what to do with them. I can't just put them in there. With, And then eventually I found that they actually spelled uh, a Kabbalistic word, yeah, which means palm tree and means a minaret, which is like a, a tower for the call of prayer. <coughs> Anyways, when you do the gamatria for it, there's some interesting that come things that come out with that. So in the last chapter of that book, there's something really special there, in my opinion. At, le at least it was special for me. So that's a, a, a book I've written, and I'm working on two more right now. Um, I have um, one book. It's called the uh, yeah. It was called the Metaphysics of Pure Will. Uh, where I'm basically, it's a book on philosophy, uh, my interpretation on what I think would be a Thelemic metaphysics, and it's mainly influenced by my studies of um, Leibniz and, and, and the existentialist schools of thought, particularly with Sartre. And, um, of course, I know that metaphysics and philosophy, in, in this sense, isn't for everybody, but for me, it, it's a real passion of mine, and it's helped me out magically a lot, um, understanding being and nothingness at the essence of things. And when I want to make change in my life, understanding that actually tuning into a nothingness can make it easier for the things that I want to come out. That's sort of pulling back when you're trying to make something happen. Or as Eliphaz Levi, Levi would say, the magical equilibrium, right? That you need to contradict a magical operation that you've done after. But any, anyway, I don't want to have too much verbal diarrhea with you guys. Uh, my other book I'm working on is more meant to be a popular book, and it's a novel. Um, and it's about a, it's partly based on a true story, and partly I'm ripping Paulo Coelho's The Alchemist. It's about a girl in Yemen uh, who's kidnapped. She's Jewish, and she's kidnapped and at the age of four or six and forced to marry uh, into an older Arabic family. And she's basically a slave for several years and she runs away and starts herding goats. And then she has a bunch of dreams and visions to find a treasure, but it's to get into Israel uh, and she has to go through there. So I had the fantasy elements of Paulo Coelho as the alchemist, but I have some real sort of uh, realism, magical realism. It's more believable kind of magical events. And there's some dark events like some rape and, you know, she has to kill a few people to actually get there. So. It's uh, something different, and I'm trying not to directly put Thelemic messages into it because that would make really shitty art, but um, you can expect to find some Thelemic allusions coming out of that. But it's meant that, you know, hopefully something that anybody can read and enjoy. Uh, but I'm only 50 pages into it, so, you know, you guys will just have to wait, but I just wanted to share that because uh, I think that really wraps up who I am and what I've been doing lately. Well, yeah, and, uh, and the that novel obviously is some time to come out, but uh, the the uh, other book that you're talking about with the, you know your philosophical and and uh, uh, metaphysical uh, thoughts, yeah. when do you expect that book to come out? I don't know. I was hoping to work on it this summer, uh, but after having to deal with too much uh, bullshit as a teacher in Israel, I've been focusing this summer on building up um, some internet businesses. Um, also, hopefully, with the idea of, you know, having more money to donate to the church as well. That's, but uh, uh, I've had some successes. I've given you some surprise donations in the past after getting some successes with some online things I was doing. I had a big uh, windfall of money when I was investing in crypto last year, and that was why I gave you a surprise donation. So ho hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, I won't say what I'm working on because it's bad luck, but... Um, if I start making some extra money on the side, you'll be getting some more donations. But it's kept me from working on my book. 
my philosophy book, I'm about 60 pages into it. I, I could make it two or 300 pages if I wanted. I, I think what I'll do is I'll actually make it shorter and then make like a series, you know, because I'd like to, because to me, to write about metaphysics, I also need to write, well, what does that then mean for ethics? What does that then mean for politics? What does that then mean for physics? Because my central thesis in Thelemic metaphysics is that we need metaphysics and we've gotten rid of it over the years. And because of that, our our physics has gotten kind of cuckoo and kind of crazy because our, we're trying to fill in this metaphysical gap with physics. <coughs> okay. And um, yeah, so hopefully in the next year or two, um, if I make a shorter book and make it a series, probably within a year, year and a half. Good. So we look forward to seeing that come out. Um, yeah. We just, uh, you know, I, I think we have other people yet in our church that we're very proud of what they do. But I think you've shown your own particular, uh, 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 your own particular <laughs> lifestyle and your own particular approach to all of this in such a different way than uh, Ricardo showed in the previous interview that we did. And, and that, I think that helps us to give our congregation, uh, you know, a chance to see, you know, some of the cream of the crop at top there <laughs> and what these people are really doing and what makes them so uh, fascinating and unique. And to, to know that everybody in our church really can come to this level, but need not, you know, come to this kind of distinction. Um, they simply need to, uh, you know, be able to ruminate over their own lives and to be conscious of who and what they are. And that's really it. J showing our showing the geniuses in our church um, doesn't mean that we're setting any standard, but that, you know, we're just uh, creating inspiration. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thanks for the generous uh, compliments. Um, um, but I, I agree. Um, as you used to say, you know, um, make the, the lamps glow and, and it will help the other lamps grow. Glow, right? It's like, you no. Know, and I think that, and, and then another thing, I, I don't know if it's you that said it, but in one of the earlier uh, letters from the AA, common thing that's passed along to new students is to remember that real power is that which we can give to others, not what we can take away as the dupes of the Black Lodge would have you think. That's stuck with me. And now the sad thing is, is most people don't believe, uh, behave that way. Uh, uh, you know, um, you start to develop a moral conduct, or at least I have. I should only really speak about myself. Um, one thing that was hard in the age, you start to develop moral standards and um, for yourself, it, which bring you happiness and they help you to succeed. For me, one is which, you know, I really believe in win-win and, you know, that you know, finding something that's good for me and good for others, it works together. And a lot of people aren't there. You know, a lot of people don't share those values that you think they would share, or they say they do, but they really don't. And um, so un unfortunately, it's true. But un unfortunately, the way the world works is, is people think that power is something that you take. And, and it's really not. Uh, I, I, you know, it definitely, you, for, for me anyways. Um, if the nature of power at, is love, you need to give it away. <laughs> yeah, and when I look at people who inspire me, um, like historical people like Nikola Tesla, and even some current people, even though mm, not everybody likes them, like um, Elon Musk, for instance. I think he's pretty cool, but, you know, others would beg to differ. Um, those are people who just gave, in my opinion. They gave and they gave and they gave. Elon Musk, you know, he, he didn't, you know, he made himself rich and he made himself rich by actually wanting to solve problems. Now, he hasn't succeeded in solving all of them, but he helped contribute to developing PayPal. Nobody really gives him credit for that. People just point out, oh, he failed to make a Tesla. You know, what a douchebag. But the thing is, is PayPal wouldn't have existed without him. He developed an earlier program that evolved into PayPal. Because, you know, he was difficult to get along with. He ended up, I think, getting kicked out of his own company. And then he moved on to do other things. But what motivated him and people like Tesla is they, they just wanted to give things, you know. Uh, 
luckily for Elon, he has a business sense, unlike Tesla. So at least he can, you know, enjoy some of his power, you know. Yeah. When, but, when uh, you give, yeah. you give, you create new gnosis. <laughs> you create new gnosis? We're not about, you know, uh, you know, giving for the local fundraising drive. We're talking about giving ideas, giving talent and skill over yeah. to uh, great things. And this is yeah, people like that. New they gnosis produce is. well. People like that. They do produce wealth. I don't mean necessarily money, you know, like. Uh, Elon Musk, he produced money, but Tesla, he produced, he just transformed the planet, you know, and his payment was just the joy he had of just pursuing inventions. Like, that's all producing he cared about. Producing wealth of the spirit, producing wealth yeah, of lifestyle. Wealth of, and know? inspiring others, and, and and as much as Edison hated them, you know, they were also inspiring each other in their own little way, you know. <laughs> Part of what it's and all it's, about. <laughs> okay then. Yeah, so, so let's, yeah, thanks a lot, PJ. Let's have, and we, I need to do an interview with you, I think, at some point, because uh, you know, being the founder of the the Gnostic Church of Light, uh, you're definitely a fascinating character with some really interesting and insightful things to say. So we'll have to also arrange an interview, if not for me doing it with you, somebody else. But um, we need to have uh, you know a documented interview with you as well. We'll, we'll get to that at some point. Yeah. You know, all right. I talk to myself, but I do enough of anyway. Um, okay, right. so with that, then we'll say goodbye uh, for this interview, and you can actually stop the recording button because you have control of the recording there. All right. Uh, one second. Uh,